Hey, good morning, church. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The Bible says I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the presence of a king. How many are thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Can we celebrate his goodness in this place? Wow. Man, what a joy it is to see you here today. We are in week two of a brand new message series that we're calling Seven Letters. So in just a moment, we're going to dive into the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to look at this letter that Jesus sent to the church in Smyrna. But before so, let's take a minute, if we can, just to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. It's been an amazing movement of God over the last six weeks. We've seen over 60 people give their heart to Jesus, many being baptized, following the Lord publicly in their faith. I had an opportunity uh, this past Monday to be up at my alma mater at Carson Newman University. I was speaking to the football team there, and we had four of those young men go public with their faith in Jesus Christ. Eight more are going to be baptized this coming Thursday. We can celebrate what God's doing on that campus. And also, man, you ought to see so proud uh, of your pastoral staff. Uh, there were six of us uh, this past Thursday. We go once a month over to Christian Academy of Knoxville. We've been invited in to lead high school small groups. And so there were six of us there this past Thursday investing in the life of these high school students. We're praying that God is going to bring about a great spiritual awakening, a revival to Christian Academy of Knoxville, and we get to be a part of of that as well. So, man, just a great time to see what God is up to and how he's moving in our midst. Last week, uh, we started this message and we looked at the first letter of Jesus to the church of Ephesus. Now, here's the deal. So, at the church of Ephesus, Jesus said, hey, I love everything about you but this one thing. You have left your first love. You used to love me. And so maybe it spoke to your heart last weekend, and you realize, man, there was a time in my life when I walked so close to the Lord, and, and my prayer seemed so powerful, and the Word just jumped alive right off the page into my mind and my heart, but I drifted. Something happened. Jesus stayed in the same place, but I drifted. I, I, I moved back, and all of a sudden I found that my spiritual walk was dry, and I needed a fresh love for the Lord Jesus. And maybe that's where you are even today, and God will speak to your heart in a fresh new way. But today we're going to talk about this second church. It's called the Church of Smyrna. And it's known as the Persecuted Church. Uh, we've got a map that you can look at. Uh, so it's about 40 miles due north of Ephesus. It's right there on the coast of the Aegean Sea. And so, so Smyrna is this church that's greatly persecuted. Now, as I read these seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey, by the way. So if you want to know where these churches are today, they're in this modern-day area of Turkey. Uh, uh, Smyrna is actually in a, in a city called Izmar, Turkey. And so the Jesus had a word of commendation to all of these churches. Hey, I love this about you. You're doing this really good. And he had a word of condemnation, but this is what I hold against you, except for this church. This is the only church of the seven churches that Jesus had nothing negative or critical to say about. And so here's this town. It's a, it's a coastal town. It's a harbor town. It's known for its trade and its commerce and its arts. There's a huge temple there to Zeus and one to Aphrodite. There's also a massive temple to Caesar Augustus himself. Here's the deal. Caesar Augustus, the emperor of Rome, was convinced that he was God. And so they built a large temple here in the city of Smyrna for Caesar Augustus. Right outside of this temple, there was a large bust of him. And there was an eternal flame, and everybody in the city, when they walked past the bust of Caesar Augustus, was supposed to sprinkle some incense on the flame and make this public proclamation that Caesar is Lord. And so those who were Christ followers, who battled with this, who struggled with this, said, I will never denounce my faith in Jesus. I will never publicly proclaim that Caesar is Lord. We're under great persecution. They were not granted their trade card. What's a trade card? Well, a trade card gave you the right to get a job, to buy, to sell, to trade in the city. And so anyone who would not profess that Caesar was Lord was not able to get gainful employment. And so they were starving. They had no jobs. They were under great persecution in this season of time. And so I, I want to kind of bring this up to modern day and acknowledge the fact that all of us as Christ's followers will in some season of our life go through times of attack, hurt, pain, frustration, suffering, Great persecution. 
And so the question that I want us to answer today is this. How do I live by faith when my world is falling apart? That's the question I want to answer today. How do I live by faith when my world is falling apart? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of worship. We know according to the scripture that you dwell within, you inhabit the praise of your children. Lord, we acknowledge the fact that you are here. You are in this room. You are in this, this place in our midst, God. You dwell within our hearts. And so I pray today, Father, as we take just a little bit of time out of the busyness of our life to dive deep into the scripture, the word of God, we believe that's inspired and infallible and without error is powerful. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. I pray, Father, that the words that you spoke, Lord Jesus, to the church in Smyrna would resonate with us today and that we would be encouraged and strengthened. We would walk out of here with a new resolve, Lord, that we would fully understand how we're supposed to live when our life is falling apart. Change us today, we pray, by your word, by the person of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are three biblical keys that I want to roll out to you this morning. How are you going to live when your world falls apart? How are you going to live when the walls come crashing in? How are you going to live when the ceiling of your life is crumbling? How are you going to live when you're under attack and persecution of the enemy? How are you going to live when disease racks your body? How are you and I going to live by faith when our world is coming apart? There are three biblical keys. Here's number one. You've got to maintain a right perspective of Jesus. Look at this, if you will, now in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 8. To the angel, remember the Greek word agelos here, A-G-G-E-L-O-S, which means a messenger. It could have been a supernatural angel, spiritual being, that was appointed to each one of these seven churches, or it could simply just be the pastor of the church. So it could read to the pastor of the church, the ecclesia. We've talked about that for about a month. The called out ones of God, the body, the bride of Christ. To the messenger of the ecclesia in Smyrna, this church of great persecution, he says, these are the words of him who is the first and the last. We have to remember who Jesus is. Number one, he is eternal. Right? He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the first in time and place and rank. And he's the last in time and place and rank. He always has been. He always will be. And here's the great news today, that Jesus Christ existed long before your struggle, long before your battle, long before your suffering. Jesus Christ will still be on the throne long after your season of battle and struggle and everywhere in between. Amen. Isn't it good news today? That Jesus is eternal. What else do we need to know about Jesus today? Not only is he eternal, but he is exalted. Look what it says here. These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life. Again, he was exalted by God the Father. Now write this down if you're taking notes. Go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Good stuff. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says this, In your relationship with one another, as Christ followers, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, verse number 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Verse 9, look at the screen. Therefore, in light of all of that, Therefore God, the Father, exalted him, there it is, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What do we need to know about Jesus when we're in the valley, when we're in a broken place, when we're in a heavy place, when your world is coming apart? You've got to acknowledge the fact that Jesus is eternal, but Jesus has been exalted by God the Father. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He's bigger than your struggle. He's bigger than your valley. He's bigger than your problems. He is exalted by God the Father. You see, when we face death, Jesus is able to say with boldness, been there, done that. Got the t-shirt, checked it off the list. He's exalted. 
What else do we need to remember about Jesus? He's eternal. He's exalted. He's empathetic towards you. Uh, I want you to see this back in Revelation 2. Verse 9, he says two words, I know. I know. I know. I know. Have you ever comforted a preschool child? She fell down and got a boo-boo. Her knees skint, is bleeding. She's crying. She don't understand. You're holding that little infant child in your arms, and you're saying, I know. I know, baby. I know. Maybe you've been in a hospital with someone with a terminal illness. Body's racked with pain. And you sit beside him, hold his hand. And all that can come out of your mouth is two words, I know. I know. I know what you're feeling. I know what you're going through. I, I know the pain. I, I know the suffering. I know, baby. I know. I know. Jesus is a, is a God who's empathetic towards us. When he says to the persecuted church at Smyrna, I'm the first and the last. I'm the one who died and came to life again. And I know by experience, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich, he says. Jesus says, I know I've already experienced the pain that you're going through. I know your afflictions. The Bible says by his wounds that we are healed. I know your poverty. Jesus said to his disciples, the son of man doesn't even have a place to lay his head, but you are rich. He's not talking about materially rich he's talking about spiritually rich i think about what jesus said in the gospel of matthew chapter 6 verse 19 and 20 can we get it on the screen jesus said do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal look at verse 20 but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus said, church, listen, I understand. Persecuted believer, I get it. I know your pain, your suffering, your struggle. And the world thinks you're poor, but I'm telling you, you're rich. You're rich in eternal reward. Because you've been faithful to me. He's empathetic towards us. No amount of attack, suffering could rob you of your joy in Jesus. You see, people on earth who don't know Jesus, they're all about happiness. I want to be happy. I want a marriage to be happy. I want a home to be happy. I want a job to be happy. I want end. Oh, but the problem is that happiness comes and goes, but joy remains through it all. Amen? And you cannot rob a Christ follower of his or her joy. Joy is what sustains you in the darkness. Joy is what lifts you up in the valley. Joy is what makes each day worth living. You can't take my joy. You can't rob our joy. Jesus says you're rich. When you're struggling, when your world is falling apart, you must maintain a right perspective of Jesus. He is eternal. He's before and after your struggle. He's exalted. God raised him from the dead. There's nothing that you could face that he doesn't know about. He's empathetic towards you. He'd say to you today, I know, I know, I know what you're walking through. I see you. I haven't forgotten you. Oh, my eyes on the sparrow, and he hadn't forgotten about you. Second thing, we must maintain a right perspective on suffering. Oh, this is good. A right perspective on suffering. Here's what I need you to know. Two things, okay? Suffering has a reason and a season. Say that with me. Say suffering has a reason. Say reason. reason. And a season. Say season. I need you to know this and understand this and believe this, that every part of suffering in your life and in my life as a son or a daughter of God has a reason and a season. I want to show it to you here in verse number 10. Look at this. Jesus says, do not be afraid. What do we know? Anytime you are afraid as a follower of Christ, this is not from God. How do we know this? The Bible says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know what that means, this phrase in the Greek, a sound mind? It literally means that you get to see things the way God sees things. So anytime you're feeling afraid, you're fearful, this is not God in your life. God has not given you a spirit of fear. So Jesus says in verse 10, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. I want you to underline that word test. Circle the word test. I'm going to come back to it, all right? He's going to put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. I want you to circle that. 10 days. Test and 10 days. Test and 10 days. That suffering 
has a reason and suffering has a season. And I want you to understand, oh, it'll help you so much if you can grab a hold of these truths today. First of all, suffering has a reason. He says that the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. It means to try you, to examine you, to put you in the fire. So here's what we've got to know. All right, look this way, church. I want you to understand this. If you are in a season of attack, suffering, brokenness, anxiety, you're going through a war in your life. You have to understand this, that either God caused this to happen to you or he allowed it to come your way. Nothing can touch your life as a son or daughter of God without his permission. Amen? Nothing gets to you since it comes through him. So every piece of suffering in your life has a reason. He says he's going to test you. Here's the example. In biblical days, when a soldier wanted to make a, a sword, and he wanted the sword to be strong enough to make it through battle, when he wanted the sword to be sharp enough, when he wanted the sword to be able to last, he would put it in the fire. He would take a piece of steel, and he would put the steel in the fire, and he would leave it in the fire until the steel got red hot. He would pull it out of the fire and immediately put it in cold water. He would pull it back out of the water and put it back in the fire until it got red hot again. He pulls it out and puts it in the cold water over and over and over. This is called the process of tempering. You ever heard of tempered steel? Why is tempered steel so strong? Why is it so hard? Why does it hold an edge better? Because there's a molecular process that the steel has been going through. When you put the steel in the fire, the molecules of the steel loosen and separate from one another. When you dip it in the cold water, they link arms together. It's like little molecules of steel linking hands, linking arms. It makes it stronger. It makes it sharper. Sharper. It makes it last through the hard and intense moments of battle. This is what God is doing with you. Do you understand? Could you just grasp that today? If you're in a valley, if you're in a heavy place, if you're in a dark place, if you're in a broken place, if you're suffering today, it has a reason. God wants to use the suffering to temper your life, to make you more like Jesus, to make you stronger when the battles come. This is what he's doing. It has reason. Second part. It has a season. Oh, praise God, there's an end to this stuff. There's an end. Look what he says. He says, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, you know there's a lot of symbolism in the Bible, particularly in the book of Revelation. We're not absolutely certain what this 10-day period means. It could have meant a very intense, literal 10-day time of persecution of the church of Smyrna. It could have been symbolic of the 10-year reign of Caesar Augustus when he was powerful and ruled and reigned in Smyrna. It could be 10 times 10, 100 years of the rule of the Roman government and the time of persecution in the life of this dear church. We don't know. We don't know exactly what this means. Either way, what we do know is it's a set time. It will come to an end. There will be a day when it is behind you. Can you grasp that today? Listen to me. Look this way. Man, if you're a Christ follower today, you say, Pastor, man, I don't get it. I'm in the fire. I'm suffering. I'm struggling. I don't know if I'm ever going to make it through. Oh, I've got good news for you today. It has reason and it has a season. And just as it started one day, it will end. God will see you through it. You'll come out the other side more like Jesus. It's just a season of time. Just a season. Just a season. Look at the screen. If we look at Psalm 35, 30 verse 5 together. Love this. For his anger, talking about God, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. How many are thankful for the rejoicing that comes in the morning of your life? The same God who ushered in the suffering in the night will be the same God who will bring the rejoicing in the morning. It's just a season. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't get tired. Don't get weary. Don't walk away. We've got to maintain a right perspective of suffering. 
Suffering has a reason. Suffering has a season. Final piece. I love this the best. How do I live by faith when my world is falling apart? Maintain a proper perspective of Jesus. Maintain a proper perspective on suffering. Number three, keep your eye on the prize. Hallelujah. Keep your eye on the prize. Don't you get distracted. Keep your eye on the prize. I want to read the last part of verse 10 and verse 11. Jesus says, be faithful, son. Be faithful, daughter. Be faithful, Christ follower, even to the point of death, and I will give you your victor's crown. Verse 11, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Keep your eye on the prize. It's twofold here. I want to talk about the latter one first. He says, those of you who overcome, those of you who conquer, those of you who endure to the end, you will not ever be touched by the second death. What is he talking about? Well, let me talk about the first death. First of all, you need to understand that every one of us in this room are dying. Every day that you live, you're closer to the grave. Every one of us one day will physically die unless Jesus Christ comes back again. How do we know it? Hebrews 9, 27, the Bible says, It is appointed unto men once to die, then the judgment. And so every person on the planet will one day die physically. It's just truth. Every day we get older, we age, our bodies deteriorate, we're, we're falling apart, and one day we will die. But here's the truth. Jesus says you've got to keep your eye on the prize. For those of you who are victorious through the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never be touched by the second death. This is a spiritual death. You will never die spiritually. The, body says, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and so shall we always be with the Lord. In the twinkling of an eye, I really believe that our last earthly breath merges together with our first heavenly breath to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Let me tell you something today, church. Don't quit. Don't give up. You remain faithful. And Jesus said, I'm going to usher you into my presence, and you will never spiritually die. You'll live in me forever in a place called glory. You know, I'll be touched by the second death. I love this piece. Jesus said back in verse 10, I will give you life, give your life a victor's crown. You know, the Bible talks a lot about crowns. I like it. The Bible says that there's a crown of righteousness that you could be rewarded with. The Bible says there's a crown of life that you could be rewarded. The Bible says there's a soul winner's crown. Oh, oh, church, I know I'm not worthy. But my prayer is, Lord Jesus, somehow, some way, when it's all over, said and done, oh, I'd love to receive a soul winner's crown. That I've spent my life sharing the gospel and seeing tens of thousands of people give their heart to you. God, I, I want a soul winner's crown. You say, why is it so important, Pastor? Well, let me just say right out of the gate, it has nothing to do with me. Because when we get to glory, it's not as though we're going to wear a crown on our head, throw back our chest, strut around and say, look at my goods, look at my bling bling. <laughs> it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about that. But here's the deal. Oh, listen to me, church. One day I believe that I'm going to breathe my last earthly breath and it's going to merge together and the air will be celestial. I'll be walking on streets of gold. I'll be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. I'll walk up to the throne of thrones of the King and King and the Creator of the universe and I just want you to know, I don't want to show up there empty-handed. Man, I want something that just like these 24 elders in the book of Romans cast their crowns at his feet. I want to be one who comes there with something of worth, of value, that I might be able to kneel down and cast at the feet of Jesus. Revelation chapter 4. Can we get it on the screen? Verse 10. The 24 elders. Who are these people? Most theologians believe it's the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Joseph and the 12 apostles of the New Testament. And so, so, so a lot of teachers think that the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament will be on one side of Jesus in glory. The 12 apostles of the New Testament will be on the other hand of Jesus in glory. But look what it's about. 
The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Watch it. Here it comes. And they lay their crowns before the throne and they say in verse 11 you are worthy our lord and god to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by you by your will they were created and have their being oh won't it be sweet one day if we don't quit if we don't grow tired and weary if we remain faithful to the end to be able to have this joy and this privilege to be able to cast our crown at the feet of Jesus. You've got to keep your eye on the prize. You can't get distracted by the things of the world. You can't grow weary. We've got to be faithful to the end. How do I live, Pastor, when, when my world is falling apart? We have to maintain a proper understanding of who Jesus is. He's eternal. He's exalted. He's empathetic toward you. We have to maintain a proper perspective of suffering. It has reason. It's just for a season. And we've got to keep our eye on the prize. That one day we'll never be touched by the second death. One day we'll receive the crown of life that we might be able to cast at his feet. You can close your Bibles up, your sermon notebooks. But man, I need you to hear what I'm about to say. This might change your faith journey dramatically. I'm going to ask Chandler if he'd come just to kind of prepare for our time of response because I really think the Lord wants to hear from each of us today. So the books of Christian history record the name of the pastor of this church called Smyrna. It's an unusual name. His name was Polycarp. P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P. You can find him in the books of history. You can Google him. His story will come up. He was a real man who actually was mentored by John, interestingly enough. John the author of the book of Revelation mentored this young man named Polycarp. Later in his life, he went on to become the pastor of the church of Smyrna. In the 50th year of this church, Polycarp was 86 years old, kind of weathered by life and the storms and kind of hunkered over as he walks along. And the Roman government became so fearful of this church, Ecclesia, called out people in Smyrna. It was growing exponentially. It was out of control. They thought, if we want to kill the church, all we have to do is kill the pastor. If we kill the pastor, the church will die. <laughs> And so they arrest this 86-year-old veteran pastor, Polycarp. They march him up to the bust of Caesar Augustus and the eternal flame. And they put a pinch of incense in his hand. And they say, Polycarp, all you have to do is sprinkle the incense on the fire and make the public statement that Caesar is Lord. His famous quote comes in this moment, been recorded and quoted over and over again. Polycarp says publicly, 86 years I have served him, and he's never done me harm. How could I deny my Lord and King, Jesus Christ? The story goes that they took Polycarp and led him to a hillside, and they tied him to a stake and lit a fire under his feet. Multitudes of people were gathered around, Roman governing officials, church people, and the ecclesia was there. The body of Christ was there. An amazing thing happens in this day 
that starts a movement of God in the city of Smyrna. Something like we've never heard of before. The eyewitnesses of this account say they lit the fire under his feet. He had a presence and a countenance of joy in this moment. You can't rob the joy of a Christ follower. As the flames begin to build under his feet, the fire went around his body. The fire would not touch him. He was a man of God. He wouldn't burn. Hallelujah. Nobody understood what was happening in this moment. It was a supernatural move of the Holy Spirit of God where there was a human being on a stake and the fire began to become more intense and the fire would go out around his body. They understood in this moment, here is a man of God full of the Holy Spirit of God. He won't burn. The Bible says, and, and, and people began to talk about this story amazingly. And Christian history records that as Polycarp stood there, the flames going around his body, his body began to glow like gold. The church rose up and cheered, clapping, celebration, excitement, joy, laughter, to the point where a Roman soldier was given the command to take a spear and he ran through the fire and pierced the body of Polycarp, taking his life. They killed the pastor, but the church exploded. It stirred the hearts of people in such a way that revival swept through Smyrna. Thousands were being ushered into the kingdom of God. Listen to me. I want you to understand today that the same God who moved the fire away from his body, the same God who made his countenance glow like gold is the same God who's walking with you today in the fire. He's the same God who can heal and deliver you. He's the same God that can give you hope and a future. He's the same God that wants to touch and heal and deliver. He's the same God who can break a stronghold or an addiction in your life. He's the same God that can put your marriage back together. He's the same God who can reach your teenage child who's running away from the things of the Spirit. He's the same God who can touch and heal a broken body. I, I don't know about you, but I'm just foolish enough to believe that. And ask the Lord, to stir our hearts that we would not quit, we would not settle for anything less than that. I don't want to just come to church. Listen to me. I don't want to just go through the motions. I don't want to just play prayer. Man, I want us to get to the place where we say the same God who delivered Polycock from the fire can deliver me from my own. And so I, I just want to ask each of you right now, in your own battle, in your own struggle, in your own war, in your own suffering, can you see Jesus for who he is? Do you understand the reason for your suffering? Do you understand it's just a season? Will you, will you press on and keep your eye on the prize? We are a people that believe in the power of prayer. We believe that when any two of us agree on anything in this place, that the God of heaven hears us and begins to move on our behalf. And so what is your cry, your cry today? What is your prayer today for endurance, deliverance, joy in the journey, purpose? God, how could I use this to minister to somebody else? 2 Corinthians 1.4 says, In the same way in which he comforted you, one day you will comfort others. Maybe God's already brought you through the fire. Maybe God's already delivered you. And what he taught you in the fire, he will use you to encourage somebody else with.